Greetings and thank you for joining this special webinar. My name is Manubhav Barua and I will be your host for today's webinar session. Fatigue damage is known to be one of the main causes of automobile failure. The key to extending vehicle life is predicting fatigue life, a task multi-physics simulation is well suited for due to its abilities to account for multiple physics phenomena and provide accurate predictions while reducing the need for physical prototyping. In this webinar, we will discuss how structural analytics can be coupled with thermal, acoustic, and electromagnetic analysis to accurately predict the fatigue life of various automotive components. To shed more light on this, I have with me Mr. Prabal Jain, uh, Applications in Engineer at Comsol. A bit about him, Mr. Jain joined Comsol as an Applications Engineer in 2021. He received his master's degree in mechanical engineering from the Birla Institute of Technology and Science, Pilani, where he worked on structural analysis of non-linear materials. Prior to joining Comsol, he worked at Geno Extrusions in Product Development. Now, before I hand it over to him, I would like to request you, the viewers, to put in your questions, which you may have during the course of this webinar in the Q&A or chat box, so that Mr. Jain can answer them post his presentation. Thank you so much. Over to you, Mr. Jain. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Manuva, Manuva, for the brief introduction. Uh, let me know when my screen is, uh, uh, is visible to you. It is visible now. Thank you so much. Good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody, to this uh, session on fatigue and durability analysis with multiphysics simulation. I am Praval from Comsol Multiphysics. And in this session, uh, we'll be discussing uh, about what is actually a fatigue, what is the purpose of fatigue analysis, why do we even need to do it, when does it happen, what are the various tactics and techniques uh, to account for fatigue, or how to predict the life to failure in, in various uh, of our applications. We'll be discussing it with, uh, with a brief introduction to console, then we'll be discussing uh, uh, about fatigue models, then we, we will be uh, understanding more over fatigue uh, with some key studies on applications in different kind of uh, scenarios. And we'll also be having Q&A, uh, as Manu Bhava has already specified. Uh, please do feel free to ask uh, any if uh, questions if you have. I will take up those questions as and when, if it pops up on my screen. And definitely we'll be having a Q&A session towards the end of this, this discussion. So let's let's dive into the, today's discussion. Uh, before going forward, I have a quick question for everyone uh, in this session about uh, um, so that I can have a brief understanding of about the audience that I am looking at. So are you a reg regular user of simulations tools or are you evaluating simulation tools for your upcoming or ongoing project? Or are you just attending this session out of your personal in, uh, interest? And if you're new to uh, multiple simulations. Okay, I see a quite a good number of uh, attendees who are a regular user of console, uh, oh, sorry, of simulation tools. And okay, uh, okay. I think the polls over, right? Okay, let, let's. Okay, and we have we also have a quite a uh, uh, good number of people who are attending the session out of uh, personal interest, and it's really uh, good to know uh, on people who are uh, diving into new fields understanding uh, uh, increasing their depth into uh, into various applications so just let me start with uh, a brief introduction to console so okay okay 
So Comsol is is a uh, is a multiphysics uh, software platform where you can uh, simulate real world designs and processes in a virtual environment. So the uh, the uh, uniqueness uh, and the best part of Comsol uh, multiphysics is uh, you can uh, you can account for various uh, physics uh, in in your actual problem. And all those physics, you can also have a, a look at the bubbles that you can see on your screen. So another interesting fact is that you can actually couple uh, uh, these physics together. So uh, all of the bubbles that you see can actually be coupled together so as to understand their bidirectional effects. So basically, uh, to realize the full benefits of simulations, uh, it may be uh, a shorter product development times or greater insights or more innovative designs or an ability to reject the flawed concepts in, in an early uh, design process or, or product development process. So these models uh, need to account for all of the physics uh, that affect the outputs um, that, that uh, one might be uh, trying to predict. So in other words, if I say, if, if you know some important physics, your uh, model is, is not uh, going to be high fidelity. So that's why uh, in many systems, uh, as engineers analyze and in, uh, involve multiple physics. Let me take it with an example. Uh, for an instance, if if you uh, want to predict how hot how hot a laptop gets, you may need to consider uh, chemical reactions in the battery and the dual heating in in electrical components and the airflow affecting cooling, or or even. Um, that uh, when the temperature is distributed over your laptop, then how is it affecting the deformation of, of various components? Uh, is it making any electrical components to lose contact or is it causing short circuit in, in any or any other hazards? So, so it's not just a heat transfer equation that you uh, need to solve uh, to get accurate uh, predictions. And that's the whole philosophy or the whole idea of console multiphysics is that it enables uh, the modeler to combine arbitrary physics together, no matter how intricately they may be coupled and to build a powerful, flexible and accurate model. So that's the uh, uh, uniqueness of console is, as I was specifying that you can uh, couple any of these physics together to understand their bidirectional effect. Another thing is that um, um, the best part of console is um, that it has a unified GUI. It means that all of the physics that you see on your screen are basically can be set up in a single GUI um, with any of the physics that you're working with. The graphical user interface will always remain the same. And even to extend uh, on if you're working on something new or if you're innovating uh, something and the equations that are not uh, generally available. So in those cases, uh, we uh, console also have an equation-based modeling interface which is again in the same GUI where you can actually uh, write, write in your mathematical equations, use them, uh, make use of the console solvers to run uh, your uh, unique equation. And even you can couple it with the default available physics interfaces. Another uh, major innovation of console multiphysics is uh, application builder. So basically this application builder is the tool that lets you turn your sophisticated model into an easy to use app that your colleagues and customers who are not into modeling can even use. So this enables uh, uh, us to contribute to the analysis process, share it among the organization. It makes the whole product development process faster uh, when it is being shared uh, among the whole organization. Okay, so yeah, this is the uh, GUI of console. Uh, we are in the left if we see is a model builder, which is also a, our, our model builder tree, or I may also say it's it's a general modeling workflow. So if you go from top to bottom, where we will see that firstly we define the geometry, then we define the materials, then we uh, and uh, account for the physics. So here comes the part that you can even add multiple physics, and this GUI that you see on your screen will will always remain the same. Uh, then after adding physics, we go for adding the mesh. Uh, um, it may be other automatically generated mesh, or we may we can create our own mesh. Then we go on to add a study, um, which may be that uh, either do we want to go for a CD state analysis or whether it is a transient analysis, 
or whether it is a, a eigenmodes or whether it is a frequency response analysis. So we can add any of the particular studies that may be applicable to the physics that you are working with. Then the last part comes about post-processing, which is a results um, where we can actually visualize all of the variables that, that were basically solved for. We can make our own expressions. And at the right, uh, we will be having a graphics window where we can interact with our geometry, our plots. Uh, at the bottom, we'll be having information window where we can keep track of our progress. So this is the uh, GUI. We'll also be uh, having a look through, through some model examples. So this GUI, as, as I was specifying, it, it will remain the same whether uh, if uh, I'm solving for structural uh, and mechanics problem, or whether I'm solving for CFD or chemical reactions. Okay, so going forward, let's uh, talk about some user stories and case studies where we will see uh, how uh, various um, industries have used uh, simulation tools for, for uh, solving their problems in especially relating to physics and have, have been successful in uh, uh, deriving their results. Okay, here's a fun, a fun fact uh, before we dive in more into fatigue is that fatigue accounts for at least 90% uh, of all service failures uh, due to mechanical issues. It may be a fun fact, but it, it, uh, when it comes to our actual problem, it's, it's a very critical phenomena, uh, which, which, uh, which can put us in troubles when, when we uh, design a product, when we actually put, a, put our uh, product in, in, in the actual wor working environment. Okay, so the first uh, user story is about thermomechanical analysis and fatigue life prediction of an uh, electronic surface mount device. So this is from uh, Catania, Italy, uh, from the B BECA uh, and test facility. So as, as you might be aware that uh, electronic devices produce a uh, very high rate of specific heat with respect to their dimensions. And exceeding the maximum safe operating temperature means a uh, strong reduction of efficiency or reliability and as well as a lifetime. So in addition, uh, I would say that electronic devices are subjected to peri periodical uh, thermal loading and combined with the thermal expansion mismatch between the different materials of the assembly. These uh, cyclic thermal uh, loading results in stress reverses as well as a uh, potential accumulation of inelastic strain uh, in in the uh, solder joints, which uh, which uh, can also be say, said as fatigue mechanical stresses, and these ultimately ca cause a, a solder joint cracking as well as interconnect uh, failure. So basically, this paper deals with uh, steady thermomechanical analysis, uh, simulating the worst working condition for an electronic uh, surface mount device. And in order to basically to compute the stress strain distribution. So here again, a uh, uh, classical ultimate tensile stress, which is one minus stress analysis is firstly performed. And, and then a thermomechanical analysis for, for uh, thermal cycle simulation was performed in order to uh, assess the uh, fatigue life for solder joint uh, under these chosen conditions. And now to this school, uh, steady thermal stress uh, states in two different ambient conditions, um, which are a uh, hot chamber as well as in cold chamber were computed. And the consequent effective plastic strain distribution uh, was uh, estimated. So it, it, uh, it finally uh, gave us a result the, about the number of cycles to failure under uh, uh, going forward with the coffin manson approach. We will look at uh, further that uh, um, why coffin mention approach was used here to predict the uh, failure life. And in which cases um, um, can we use coffin mention method, mention method as well as if there is any other method that we can utilize in, in a similar application uh, with the nonlinearities in our structure. Okay, so this is another interesting user story from uh, Costa Rica Institute of Technology on fatigue analysis of an aluminum tricycle frame. So in this uh, work, basically a uh, fatigue finite, finite element analysis is performed. And here the purpose is to evaluate the design improvements uh, made, uh, made to an aluminum tricycle frame. 
And in this case, uh, stress and dis deformation distributions were evaluated for different uh, combinations of fluid. And basically, uh, uh, stress and distributions were, uh, were af uh, after the computation, um, um, the analysis of the structure characteristics of, of tricycle frame was carried. And then a fatigue analysis was carried out by comparing the stress levels present in, in the structure uh, to the fatigue limit of the aluminum material. Uh, and with this result, it revealed that the long-term durability of the design is compromised. And for this reason, reason additionally, uh, fatigue simulations have been developed in order to improve the uh, design of the tricycle. And basically to improve the design of tricycle, uh, uh, they used the com uh, console multiphysics um, where they used, uh, they worked with SN curves for the material to better evaluate the number of cycles. Uh, the structure might uh, again handle before before the fatigue crack appears or some part of the tricycle fields. And so uh, for uh, basically due to this uh, low, low fatigue life ex uh, uh, as it was expected from the result. So this aluminum material could represent a better choice for, for the tricycle fabrication. And some parts of the tricycle may require being reinforced or, or redesigned. So with this, uh, the computational simulations have provided them useful information for improving the uh, mechanical performance of the tricycle. So in this case, if we see, um, this was um, the loading pattern of the whole, uh, over the whole frame. And in this case, we can see that uh, there was some high stress concentrations um, um, near to the weld beds. And these both plots basically uh, depict the fatigue usage factor. And we can see that wherever we had a, um, a quite high stress uh, concentration, we can see that, uh, that the fatigue usage factor is going over, above one, which means that this, uh, these are the parts which, which will, uh, are most likely to fail in the given loading conditions. Okay. Now, since uh, we have been quite talking about uh, fatigue, so let's start with a uh, look into it. What what actually is fatigue is? So basically, uh, fatigue phenomena uh, fatigue is a phenomena where a uh, component fails after repeated loadings and unloadings, even through though the magnitude of each individual load uh, may be much smaller than than the ult uh, ultimate stress of the material. So when a fatigue failure occurs, the process can be divided into three distinct stages. The first stage is, is about the fatigue failure, where uh, during a large number of load cycles, which are basically repeated loadings and unloadings, damage is uh, accumulated on the micromechanical scale. And after some time, uh, a crack of macroscopic size is basically formed. And in the next two stages comes the part where fracture mechanics comes into play, where in the stage, stage two of this crack development, the macroscopic crack grows for each new load cycle. And when this for, is further increased, when the crack has reached a certain size, the remaining material can, can no longer sustain the peak load and the component basically starts to fail. So, and so for this, um, for, uh, Predicting the life to failure, there's, uh, there's this uh, fatigue module in, in the console multiphysics, where the whole purpose of this module is to simulate the influence of repeated loading and unloading on the integrity of structural components, to estimate the fatigue uh, damage based on different fatigue models, as well as to evaluate the influence of geometrical dimensions and material selections on the fatigue. And all these purposes uh, have, uh, have a quite uh, wide applications in various industries like automotive, aerospace, electronics. And basically with this, uh, we can also account for nonlinearities in the materials, uh, as well as we, we can all definitely account for geometric nonlinearities. And if we have a quite uh, complex assembly of components, we can also couple it with multi-body dynamics module. Um, so the next part is understanding uh, how fatigue analysis is done. So basically this uh, fatigue analysis is done in two steps, 
with the first step is the load cycle is uh, simulation wherein uh, uh, in, in the load cycle simulation, the load history in terms of stresses, strains, or energy dissipation is computed. And then in the next stage of fatigue evaluation, the history of this load cycle is processed in, in the fatigue study step to assess the risk for, for the uh, failure. And since uh, the, the first step is load cycle simulation, so this, this load cycle simulation may be uh, accounting for various kinds of physics interfaces. Wherein you can work with solid mechanics as well as multi-body dynamics. You can also account for the uh, shell elements, even the plate or even the membrane elements. Membrane elements are basically the one which uh, does not have any bending stiffness in, in the relaxed state, but they do get some bending stiffness, uh, but it is due to the st stiffening factor when, when it is basically put up in some stress state. Then this uh, load cycle simulation, uh, you can get the load histories um, in, in different scenarios, whether this load, steer, load history may be uh, time dependent or it may be uh, stationary between two different kinds of loads, or it may be having a sweep between different uh, loading steps where you can sweep the whole uh, loading step or any other boundary conditions. Or it may be if, if you are working with deterministic vibrations, it may be having a load which is uh, having a, uh, which is a harmonic in nature. And if we are working with a non-deterministic load, then we can also input the PSD data, which is, which is a common case of random vibration. So there are various fatigue models, uh, which, uh, um, um, which can be applied in different kinds of applications. Uh, some of them are stress-like or strain-like, then we uh, then we also have stress based and strain based then if we are having any energy dissipation then we can go for it, uh, energy based or if the load uh, amplitude is changing with each of the time then we can go for uh, cumulative damage and if we are looking at uh, uh, harmonic vibration then we can go with harmonic uh, vibration models as well as random vibration if if we have it in uh, uh, non-deterministic in nature. So you see, uh, we will now try to understand that uh, since there are a lot of uh, fatigue models, then what actually these models is uh, when to use them? Uh, in which of the application can we understand that whether this uh, model, fatigue model is applicable for our case or whether it is not? So let's start with understanding uh, stress life as less stress-based models. So basically, uh, the stress life model is used to calculate the fatigue life based on the fatigue life curve that relates uh, load cycle stress amplitude to the life. And it is one of the old, oldest methods for fatigue evaluation. And it is also a very popular method since the relation can be easily obtained from fatigue test. In this case, if the load amplitude in, in the load cycle is below the endurance limit, the component does not fail in fatigue. Uh, but if the endurance is, limit is exceeded, the component does fail in fatigue. And if the number of load cycles is, is basically the large enough, in cases with uh, at constant load cycles, the structure is basically affected by repeated uh, repeatable load sequence. And in this case, you need to determine whether the loading is proportional or non-proportional. To, to give you a brief hint on uh, proportional loading, basically in, in proportional loading, the orientation of principal stresses and stresses does not change uh, during the load cycle. So it's a proportional loading is basically a situation where the orientation of uh, principal stresses and strain will remain the same during the whole load cycle. And in a, another way uh, to discriminate between these two cases uh, is to consider the characteristics of the external load. With, with one source of the external load uh, can be the structure response is, is basically which is defined by a stress tensor where all components change in phase. Okay, so for non-proportional loading, we can uh, go with stress-based models uh, when, when we are having a high cycle fatigue. Whereas, uh, then we also have stain life models as well as stain based models. So let's look at in the way that uh, 
that most of the structural applications operate in the elastic regime. But uh, there are some local inelastic deformation uh, that can, however, occur at stress concentrations. And although it, it is con uh, concentrated to a small volume, um, but the repeated increase in inelastic strains can introduce a crack. And once, it's, uh, once a crack is formed, it is easily driven by low stresses. And then the fatigue is said to be strain controlled, uh, since the strain will be limited above the yield stress. And it will does not be a good indicator of the severity of the loading. And hence, uh, fatigue limit here will be based on constant strain uh, conditions uh, which may be necessary for this type of analysis. Then coming on to uh, strain-based models. So these type of models are frequently used for low cycle fatigue modeling. In low cycle fatigue uh, analysis, basically the plastic strain in each cycle are significant on a microscopic scale. So these strains uh, must not uh, must then be computed, which um, many times is the main challenge of the analysis. So there are again two fundamental me uh, methods to handle uh, these kind of problematic scenarios. One may be a full elastoplastic analysis, and the another approach can be uh, the elastic analysis with an approximation of the plasticity. Then coming on to the understanding on uh, energy-based as well as uh, cumulative damage models. <coughs> so basically these are, uh, if we talk about the elastic materials, so as you might be aware that these elastic materials store elastic energy upon loading. And this energy is, is restored once the structure is unloaded. In elastic materials, um, uh, basically these uh, dissipate some energy through a non-reversible reversible process. And this dissipated energy has been used to define the fatigue criteria in several materials, since the, it, this can capture the testing hysteresis effect. And depending on the application, uh, the dissipated energy is defined in different ways, such as as an example, if I talk about the dissipated creep energy or, or dissipated viscoplastic energy, or it may be the energy of, of a specific creep process, or even the combined dissipations from different sources. So in those cases, when we have, when we are expecting any kind of energy release, uh, we can go uh, forward with these energy-based models. Then coming to the cumulative damage, uh, basically when, when fatigue damage is caused by random load history or a variable load, is, is not uh, as easily quantified as damage load from constant load cycle. So the correct simulation of the fatigue process plays a key role to predict the life of a structure. And here again, the nature of the service load history needs to be determined and the accumulated damage must be defined. So in this cumulative damage evaluation, the load is first processed with the cycle counting method, uh, which, which may be rain flow counting for an example. And it is then followed by the damage estimation, estimation according to the uh, Pongren minor linear damage model. So basically uh, here, what we are doing is we are firstly counting the load cycles and converting it, it into a stress distribution or of the applied load history. And then we are uh, estimating the damage following a different method, which in here we can, uh, for an example, we can account with uh, Pongren minor linear damage models. Okay, then we have this um, frequency-based models, which are harmonic vibration and random vibration models. So in, in a harmonic vibration uh, fatigue analysis, uh, basically a component is subjected to a forced harmonic excitation. And in general, if I say then when the excitation frequency approaches an eigenfrequency of the object, we will see that their stresses show a strong increase. And in the harmonic vibration evaluation, only the deterministic vibration uh, can again be simulated. So again, in this case uh, too, uh, the analysis will be done in two steps. Firstly, uh, the stress responses at given excitation frequencies are computed, uh, where we, we can use a frequency domain study step, where we will be work, uh, analyzing a stress distribution in, uh, uh, in, in uh, frequency responses. And in the subsequent fatigue studied uh, uh, step, will uh, the damage is estimated according to Pongren minor uh, damage rule, 
which uses again the ascent curve to determine the fatigue life. So for an example, in, in uh, general, if I say uh, when a component is excited at a constant frequency, its dynamic response changes uh, and uh, response undergoes uh, uh, two phases. Uh, one first phase, an initial air transient phase, which is followed by a steady state phase. And in this, uh, during, uh, during this transient phase, which is usually a uh, short in time, the dynamic response goes from the state of the previous excitation frequency or standstill to the state of the current excitation frequency. And during this steady state phase, a uh, component basically oscillates so that a, a repetitive stress response is experienced for, for each consecutive cycle. So then going forward uh, to random vibration uh, fatigue. So this can be the case when the loading on the structure is random and it which, which can be uh, defined by a PST spectrum. So here again, a stress life approach can be used to assess the uh, fatigue usage the, uh, using the palm ground minor uh, damage model. Here again, the loading PST will effectively uh, produce, produce a stress response uh, PSD at, at every location in the structure. And this uh, response PSD is used to assess basically the fatigue. And as the process is random, uh, no, uh, no finite time uh, sample of the response uh, will be identical to this uh, to the next. So in this way, we can we can also account for the uh, we can also predict uh, the life to failure in the cases of random vibration. The most common example uh, that I have found uh, that I can think of um, for random vibration is in the uh, wind turbine industry as well as in the automotive industry. Because when in when when in the automotive industry, we might not be very well aware of the road conditions, and to uh, mimic that behavior, we go with uh, random vibrations uh, uh, experimental test. We obtain a PSD, then we give it as an input to simulations, and that's how we define or or we design our new product or optimize our overall product. Since uh, okay. Since from quite some we, uh, time, we have seen a uh, different type of fatigue models. So uh, let's, uh, let's uh, start with taking an example of, of one of the fatigue model. So here in, uh, I have an example of a reciprocating piston engine uh, where, we'll, uh, where a high cycle fatigue of, uh, is basically calculated. So here in a connecting rod in an engine is identified as a critical component and its fatigue life is basically predicted. And here in the connecting rod is modeled as flexible while all other parts are rigid bodies. So as you might be aware in, in, in a reciprocating engine, uh, the connecting rods basically transfer rotating motion into the reciprocating motion. And these connecting rods are constantly subjected to high stresses and the load increases with the uh, engine speed. And a failure of one part in the engine usually results in, in a replacement of the whole engine. And it is therefore of crucial importance to uh, design all engine parts so that none of them fail uh, during the operation, operational lifetime. So here in, again, the, as I was mentioning that the connecting rods are defined as critical parts and are here analyzed from the fatigue perspective. So basically the fatigue lifetime is predicted in here using the Baskin uh, high cycle fatigue uh, criteria. So this example is based again on three cylinder reciprocating engine, wherein uh, one, only one connecting rod is modeled as flexible uh, while the remaining parts are modeled as, as the rigid bodies. And the connection between different parts are basically obtained by using different types of joints, which have been simulated using the multi-body dynamics module. So uh, keeping all other uh, parts as, as rigid while only the critical part is uh, flexible, uh, with this technique, uh, it, it significantly reduces the model size while maintaining the force equilibrium in, in the assembly. So here in uh, the graph that you see is, is basically the stress history in a fillet of, of the piston end of the connecting rod. So here in one may have a question why, why do we are, why are we seeing a stressicity just on the fillet? So in the example that, uh, that we just see in the animation that we just saw, so basically uh, 
urine uh, fillet is chosen since the stress concentration due to geometrical changes expected there and a few revolutions re are uh, again must be completed from before a steady state behavior is obtained so here in we can see that from cycle 3 uh, the statistic for each consecutive cycle seems to repeat itself and both the peak stress and the stress cycle in general is about here in the same from after the uh, third cycle or almost after the third cycle so here uh, thus basically the statistic is dominated by the third principle stresses since the connecting rod that we just saw is in compression and the other two principal stresses are so small that the that the uh, stress state at the fillet can be considered uniaxial and we can see that uh, one of the stress is is getting significantly very higher than the other two stresses so therefore um, the third principal stress can be taken as uh, amplitude stress in the baskin relation uh, for fatigue life calculation uh, another case can be we can also use a one my stress but as as i as, as we just discussed here in this case, we can also use only the third principle stress um, for calculating fatigue life. So this is basically the uh, fatigue uh, life at various locations of, of the connecting rod. So this is how the fatigue life will be, uh, will be distributed during the whole reciprocating motion. So here in the critical point is basically, as you can see, it is located at one of the fillets of the connecting rod. Since the st stress state is purely uniaxial in, in that point, and the Buskin relation from the stress life family is, is used to predict the fatigue. In, okay, so here in we can see that um, the minimum life to failure is occurring uh, in a range of around 4.01 E9 number of cycles. While at rest of the region, it is significantly higher than than the than that at fillet, where we can see that uh, there there was a quite high uh, stress concentration connect uh, compared to the other parts of this connecting rod. So we will see that uh, the connecting rod is most expected to fail from this uh, from this uh, fillet end, uh, from which is basically connected to the piston at at the, at the topmost point. Okay, so here we worked with high cycle fatigue, wherein we had a, a stress history, which was a kind of periodic in nature due to the rotation of a whole uh, reciprocating engine. And basically we transferred uh, and calculated stress history from multi-body dynamics, transferred it to fatigue, wherein with the high cycle fatigue equations, we coupled with the stress histories, and then we calculated the fatigue life uh, over the whole component. Okay, since uh, we are quite talking about uh, different kind of fatigue models, so one may be in in uh, in uh, doubt that uh, in which scenario should why should I be using which one of the models? So this is here uh, I kept a guide for choosing which fatigue model to use based on your modeling needs. So uh, okay. So before running a fatigue analysis, uh, you need to determine which fatigue model accurately reflects your case. And you may know that uh, which fatigue model to use uh, based on prior knowledge from previous cases. And if not, uh, you can definitely, uh, you can decide on a model based on the loading conditions and expected fatigue failure. So uh, generally speaking, basically the load cycles can be divided into the following cases, uh, like the proportional loading, as well as the non-proportional loading or the variable loading or the variable amplitude loading. So basically uh, in proportional loading, the orientation of principal stresses and stresses does not change. So in case of proportional load, if you still have a high cycle fatigue, then one can go with a stress life model. And if, if, uh, if one is going for a low cycle fatigue, then they can go with the uh, strain life model. And again, in here, uh, uh, for the non-proportional loading, wherein the direction of stresses or strains, uh, strains may vary. So again, under the non-proportional loading, if we have a, um, if we still have a high cycle fatigue, then we can look at the uh, at the st stress space models. But if we st if we still have a low cycle fatigue, then we can go forward forward with the strain based models. 
So again, um, the stressed or strain relation might not be uh, sufficient alone uh, for characterizing fatigue properties. And in those cases, uh, energy-based models uh, can be used. So for, let's say for variable amplitude loading, where there is not a constant cycle, uh, and the entire load history is considered, in which case you would use a cumulative damage model or uh, lastly, if uh, there is a PSD loading, then one can go with the random vibrational uh, model. Okay, so I hope uh, you get a, a good uh, hint on uh, what kind of um, uh, white perspective model that uh, we should be looking at when in, in which of our application. And then uh, further, we have uh, sub models in each of the category. Okay. So yeah, I have another query for everyone. Like uh, I'm interested in using simulation for failure uh, prediction uh, in structure vibration application or in application with multiple physics or uh, materials with non-linearities or prediction of welds and joints. And also if you have any other application, you can please feel free to type it in the questions tab. Okay, I see quite a, a, a good number of people who are interested in uh, for failure prediction in material with nonlinearities as well as with multiple physics. And interestingly, there is a good uh, uh, number of people who are also interested in failure prediction in structural vibration applications. That's that's really interesting to know. Okay, I think uh, we can go forward. Okay. So here in, uh, I have another interesting case studies on uh, stress optimization with fatigue evaluation. So in this case, uh, shape optimization with respect to fatigue prop, uh, uh, properties, uh, uh, it might not be supported, but the fatigue properties are very well correlated with the maximum stress. So with the with uh, accounting for the stresses, uh, shape optimization has been done here. And based on the shape optimization, we are trying to understand how does it affect our fatigue life, as well as um, since the fatigue uh, life will be very much dependent on the stress concentration as well as distribution. So we will see that how shape optimization can further uh, have, uh, lead us to more uh, uniform stress distribution, as well as help us in increasing the um, the fatigue line. So herein we have initial geometry, uh, which is uh, together with the optimized geometry. Uh, the one that we see is the initial geometry at the right, we have uh, uh, an optimized geometry. So here in for shape optimization uh, and criteria, which is a uh, minimization of P norm for the one my stress has been used, which is again a heuristic method. But with this heuristic method of fatigue life has been evaluated before and after the optimization. So we can see that uh, before optimization, we had, uh, quite, uh, uh, we had a quite stress concentration at this particular point, wherein it, uh, it was leading to failure at this particular uh, curve. But as with shape optimization, it lead to um, increase in the fillet radius at this particular region. So here, and we can see that the, this was the overall dis stress distribution over the bracket. And if we see that there was a quite high stress concentration near to the fillet, but with shape optimization, we can see that uh, fillet radius in this region as well as in these regions have been uh, improved uh, or changed with the automatic solver. And we can see uh, comparing the results that previously we were having uh, that this uh, fillet end was failing. But after uh, shape optimization, we can see that this shape is a little bit changed and which basically lead to increase in the fillet radius and which basically increase the life of, of this bracket um, where from the fillet end where it was failing at, at the earliest. And we also have an interesting uh, case of a thermal fatigue of a surface mount resistor. So here in a, uh, again, a surface mount resistor is subjected to thermal cycling. 
And these stresses are basically caused by differences in thermal expansion. And with this, we, uh, we got to know that this solder is basically the weakest link of the overall assembly. And basically the creep deformation, it uh, occurs since the temperature is quite high compared to the multi melting point of the overall solder. And with this, uh, we further move forward for fatigue life predicting uh, using different uh, fatigue models. So here, and we can see that uh, the highest strains occur in the thin solder layer just below the, the resistor. And it is mainly the shear strain component which contributes to the equivalent uh, creep strain in that layer. And nevertheless, basically the location of the highest strain uh, agrees well with the crack path in the real application. And in the figure, we can see that equivalent creep strain and the sh shear creep strain components are basically shown. And it is clear from uh, that the first cycle is not the representative for the fatigue analysis, uh, since its response uh, differs significantly from the one ex uh, experienced in the following cycles. And we can see that even after six cycles of this repeated loading, the stress strain curve has not uh, been uh, stabilized. And this is uh, the shear uh, hysteresis eva uh, evaluation in the critical point just below the resistor. And we can see the dissipated energy basically represents here a combined uh, contribution of changes in the stresses and strains uh, during a, a cycle uh, with, with, with this shear hysteresis. So it, uh, even here, and we can see that the temperature cycling can be extended with additional cycles to evaluate whether the state stabilizes further or not. And under some conditions, it may happen uh, that the hysteresis loop is moving in the stress strain space. So we will see that uh, with the last uh, stress state uh, or the stress cycle that we uh, that we got, assuming that the, the consecutive cycles follow the trend and deform less as, as well as the dissipate less energy. The fatigue analysis uh, based on the results of the six cycle gives, gives a prediction, a fatigue predict prediction. Here, and if we see the fatigue life is basically based on the coffin mention as well as with the marrow model, which is based on the dissipated energy. And we can see that uh, fatigue based on the strain gives a lifetime of about 800, uh, approximately 800 cycles. While the energy uh, prediction gives us uh, 1,400 uh, cycles, which leads to us that this coffin mention gives us a uh, uh, more uh, conservative, uh, uh, fatigue life of this uh, surface mount resistor. Then we have uh, uh, an example on fatigue during random vibration. So in, in many engineering uh, situations, as you might be aware that these structural components are basically subjected to loading. That one can be uh, considered random. So one example can be found in electro uh, consumer electronics where vibrations are exerted onto the circuit boards and similar components are more or less random. So in order to make a traditional fatigue assessment of these components like these, one would need to take very large time domain sample of the vibration and perform a time domain fatigue analysis. And in most situations, this is basically impractical. So instead, uh, we take a uh, statistical information about the vibration in the form of power spectral density spectrum or PST. And then we go for the fatigue assessment instead of use, uh, while using this information. So in, in this case, again, we used uh, the PST data and we got to know that uh, fatigue life uh, uh, following with different models, uh, which is bandits as well as Torlik. We can see that uh, both models predict a critical point near a uh, stress concentration uh, at the fillet. But we can see that this uh, that the bended, bended uh, model pre predicts uh, a shorter life than the Dalex model. So basically, here in this case, bended's model tends to be conservative when the stress response is is not a narrow bend. And again, we have uh, an interesting example of cumulative damage evaluation, which is about a thin wall frame with a cutout. And again, it's subjected to some uh, repeated load. 
So although here in the stresses are expected to far to be far below the yield level of the material, a concern here will arise uh, whether or not the component feels due to fatigue. So here in uh, our inflow counting algorithm reduces the stress history uh, into a discrete stress distribution. And basically the accumulated damage is based on the palm ground minor damage rule, uh, which basically the long load history is where it's processed using the concept of superposition. So we can see that uh, this is a graph that we got from the counted stress cycles, wherein we had this input as a frame load history. And again, uh, we have an interesting example from uh, for high cycle fatigue, which is about a non-proportionally loaded circular test specimen, which is also again a benchmark model. So here in we uh, compared it with three different methods, uh, which are uh, Findlay, Mataki, as well as normal stress. But in this case with Mataki, we can see since these methods are based on critical plane, we can see that the stress distribution or the fatigue life is not very smooth, which means that uh, the critical plane selection that we made during the uh, problem setup uh, certain needs certainly a change on uh, selecting the correct uh, shear planes. Then in cases of low cycle fatigue, uh, which is again an example on elastoplastic cylinder, which is uh, loaded with parame parameterized sinusoidal force. So in those, in this case, again, uh, a load carrying component of a structure is subjected to multi-axial uh, cyclic loading. And a low cycle fatigue analysis of the part based on the Smith-Watson topper model is calculated. And herein, uh, due to localized yielding, you can use two methods to obtain stress and strain distribution, which we uh, discussed uh, previously again. And we can see that due to plasticity, uh, Two load cycles are basically necessary to obtain a steady state of the uh, of the stress cycle. In this case, if we see that uh, this uh, basically we got uh, from the von Mises plot, we got them that this uh, it, it, this component will fail near to the notch. While uh, if we look at the um, first cycle as well as uh, steady load uh, cycle, which is again uh, solid as this test, we can see that how the plastic strain plots, which, which will vary in the initial phase as well as in steady state, while this will also uh, be reflected in the stress plots. Okay. Let's look at, uh, uh, we'll show you uh, how to set up these models, uh, how these models are are basically set up for the fatigue life calculation with, with just a, a quick uh, software demonstration. Oh, let me just open a model here. Okay. So here in, uh, in this case, I have an example model where, which is about a bracket. And in the first case, as, I, as we were discussing on the uh, uh, modeling workflow, where you first go for defining the geometry. Yeah, and this is uh, basically the GUI, so which will again remain the same, which uh, no, uh, no matter which are physics or interfaces that we account for. Like in this case, we have accounted for solid mechanics as well as fatigue. Then going forward, uh, materials are being assigned to this geometry. And then firstly, we accounted for the solid mechanics, wherein we applied our boundary conditions as well as constraints where some fixed constraints are applied at these bolt holes. And the actual, uh, or, or actual direction uh, boundary load, which is again the X direction to this pin holes have been applied. And if you check here, we have applied it uh, with the multiplication of a para. Wherein we have defined para value to be zero in, in our input parameters. And again, for calculation of fatigue, uh, a new physics interface for calculation of fatigue has been added. <coughs> Wherein we will define that, do we want to calculate fatigue over the whole domain or surfaces or edges or points? Where we can choose what kind of damage uh, fatigue uh, model do we want to account for, whether it is stress life based or whether it is strain based or stress based or whether it is frequency based or cumulative damage models. So let's say here in we have a stress life model <coughs> wherein we have selected from solid mechanics, we should be picking our stress history. 
And the criteria that right now we are following is the SN curve, wherein we have again given SN curve interpolation function. Uh, let's look at this function. And yeah, so this is the SN curve wherein uh, we can see that with uh, increase in our stress levels, how the fatigue life is decreasing. If we didn't had this um, SN curve, we can also account for Baskin or approximate SN curves. We can apply stress uh, factor, which is now currently we have taken it as one. We can also account for stress corrections. Then we went for uh, adding the mesh, wherein we kept a quite good mesh or finer elements uh, towards the corner region where we are expecting a good stress concentration. Then with this uh, added physics interfaces for calculation of stress history, uh, calculation of fatigue life, two studies are being added. Firstly, a parametric sweep steady state analysis with a parametric sweep from zero to one. <clears throat> we calculate the stress history. And in the next case, uh, we calculate the fatigue taking in the stress history calculated in study one. From the study one, we get that uh, there are uh, quite high stress concentrations from, we can see that it is basically banding in the X direction. Well, we are getting some stress concentrations in these sharp corners of the fillets. So with this, uh, when we accounted with in the fatigue uh, model, we can see that uh, uh, we were having a minimum life at, at these sharp corners. And we also had due to stress distribution, we also had these uh, components to be having um, this surface to be having a little bit less life than rest of the component. Well, this shop corners already uh, were failed if we go beyond the stress limits uh, <coughs> from which we got uh, the life uh, uh, to failure as, as 8.36 E3. Okay. So similarly, you can also account for any other uh, physics interface, which might be solid mechanics or shell or multi-body dynamics. You can account for different uh, fatigue models. You can also account for material non-linearities, like uh, whether it is plasticity or creep phenomena, or if you want to account for viscoplasticity, or even the thermal expansion. So you can also account for thermal temperature effects uh, on the overall stress distribution, which is basically the thermal stresses. Okay. Okay, so uh, this brings me to the end of today's discussion. Uh, so before we jumping in into question and answers, I have a, a, another question from everyone, like after this session, would you like to connect with a COMSO representative or would you like to try out, try out the, try it out for your projects? Okay, so by the time, let me just look at the questions. Okay, so I think we got uh, quite a good numbers on connecting with console representative while trying out it uh, for your projects. Yeah, we will definitely be happy to assist you in in uh, in evaluating your problems. Uh, we can definitely connect back uh, after the session on understanding more over your problem, uh, how it can be done, how it can be resolved, or if possible, how it can be simplified. Okay. So uh, this brings me uh, towards the question and answer uh, session. Thank you so much for this very immersive presentation, Mr. Jain. I think we've all learned quite a lot today. Um, I do have a few questions of my own, as well as the audience have also, you know, posted the questions in the Q and A box. Mm -hmm. um, my first question is that. Um, 
when you were speaking about thermal fatigue can you give us some examples for that yes actually uh, we do have quite some examples so uh, during this session we also discussed uh, on those examples on thermal fatigue mm -hmm. and if you if you would like to look on your own so you can definitely go on to comsol.com uh then on the website uh, you will be getting uh, either user stories uh, if you scroll down at the bottom you will be getting user stories as well as papers as well as some application uh, model and application library so you can go to uh, any of these uh, if you want to look at uh, user stories where people have used tool to a simulation tool console to predict their uh, failure life in thermal uh, fatigue or you if you want to uh, have some example models that if you want to try it on your own so you can definitely go on to the website just type in thermal fatigue and you will be getting some example models uh, again with the uh, sor model files as well as the step wise procedure to set up it from the scratch so which means that if you are not aware of the simulation or even about the tool it will guide you from the very sketch how to uh, set up that particular model all right and one question we had from the audience uh, saurabh jain asked we wanted to ask at what torque level normal cut gears will not be a feasible option and precision formed gears will become a necessity can oh. you help me as answer that question just uh, okay can you please repeat the question okay at what torque level normal hmm. cut gears will not be a feasible option and precision formed gears will become a necessity okay so it will depend a lot on uh, the kind of material uh, that we are using as well as uh, it will depend on the load that that we are putting up on the uh, on the gears so it will be a very vague if i just uh, uh, give a random value on the torque uh, which torque it will pay but definitely it will depend on whether it is made up of uh, structured steel or titanium or any other material so again we'll need to analyze it with uh, static or any uh, uh, structure analysis to understand with uh, uh, wear we should be accounting for the wear as well as uh, how is it affecting the contact pressure distribution between gears as well as uh, if there is any uh, material non linearity phenomena like a creep or any other thing as well as uh, thermal expansion because uh, i'm expecting that uh, when somebody will be running uh, these gears at high speeds there will be some uh, heat dissipation then how is it affecting our stress distribution uh, with that as well as then how the fatigue life will be uh, basically be uh, uh, affected so most probably i think uh, cumulative damage as well as energy based models uh, should be uh, uh, if i talk about in wider sense should be uh, having the most application in this case all right and this anonymous question we had in the q and a box uh, which says does this software supports hyper elastic material Yes. So basically, a uh, hyperelastic city is a uh, non-linearity in the material phenomena. Okay. So Comsol does support a uh, hyperelastic materials, where we also have a lot of predefined material models for hyperelasticity. Uh, I will just quickly show you if, uh, yeah, I hope my screen is visible. Sure. Please go ahead. Okay. So here in um, the um, just give me a second. Uh, we can't see it right now. Can you share your uh, screen again? uh okay yeah okay yeah, perfect yeah okay so here in uh, we see another solid mechanic uh, in the example model that we set up we used feed elastic material but instead we could we could also use various other material models which may be other the non linear elastic material where we can write your own uh, material model uh, if you have if you have some uh, something in your mind while if you are looking for hyperelastic material so you can directly uh, define the hyperelastic material as well as there are some uh, predefined material models following to up uh, to the material nonlinearities and if i talk about the hyperelasticity so there are these are the various models which depend on different steel energy density functions and definitely uh, if you are innovating something then definitely you can write your own uh, elastic strain energy density function which can be useful for defining your own hyperelastic material model
So this can be very easily accounted in, in console. You can account for, with the fatigue. Okay. And when you were discussing IC engine model, why was stress life model used there and not uh, energy based? Can you help me with this? Okay. So, okay. So, um, as, as we discussed when, uh, when we were discussing both stress life models as well as um, energy based models, when we were discussing the different types of models. So, we saw that uh, stress life models is uh, is basically used when we are ex expecting high cycle fatigue. So this is one of the intuition uh, that uh, that I had when modeling that example model that it would be a high cycle fatigue. While also uh, in energy uh, uh, energy based model, um, if we are expecting that uh, there will be any creep energy dissipation as well as viscoelasticity energy dissipation, or maybe due to inelastic material which we didn't use because we applied a linear elastic material. So if you are expecting those uh, energy dissipations, then definitely we should be going in those case with uh, uh, energy-based model rather than the stress life model. But in that case, I was working with uh, uh, linear elastic material and I was not quite expecting um, or I didn't want it to account for those uh, creep effects. So that's why we uh, I went for this stress life model since uh, I, I, we, I was having it as in, in the high cycle fatigue range. All right. And this one question from Salvin Jeffy in the chat box is, have you performed any correlation with physical tests? And can you let us know the percentage of correlation? Okay. So, uh, okay, again here, uh, now we do have, uh, before we publish any functionalities, we do perform benchmarks, our relation, uh, the closeness of our simulation results or the functionality that we have developed with the uh, benchmarks. So when we were discussing that high cycle fatigue model, which was on the uh, cylindrical specimen. So that's again a benchmark in the, in the fatigue industry for high cycle fatigue. So definitely we, uh, if you look at the, I will just come back to that PPT again. Okay. Yeah, so here. <clears throat> so here, this is the benchmark model. So here, in, when we were talking about our different- uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we can't see the screen yet. Okay, it's, yeah. okay, I think we need to share it again. No worries, yeah. perfect. Yeah. yeah. So here, in, this is again a benchmark model where we compare the simulation results with the, with the experimental results as, as well as with the benchmarks. And in here, again, we, uh, we were able to get a quite a very good uh, uh, closeness of the results with the uh, actual uh, experiments. And we were even able to predict that uh, using different uh, material models in different scenarios, how does it affect uh, the closeness of our results with uh, different uh, experiments? So yeah, all the functionalities that we uh, publish is, is very well uh, validated with different benchmarks as well as uh, verification validation models. All right. Um, Badrinath Mekap has a question uh, and he asks, how, how does Comsol support electromagnetic simulation engine mounts, particularly EV mounts? Okay. So I'm, ex I'm assuming here uh, uh, EV mounts is, is basically these mountings are basically made at different uh, uh, locations in the, in the body to support. And here in, again, I think uh, that there is some electromagnetic uh, system that is ultimately um, causing any kind of vibrations. So yeah, in console, you can definitely um, solve for those system for electromagnetic simulations, wherein you can solve, as, as you can see on your, in the screen, whether it is uh, in, in the high frequency range or whether it is a low frequency electromagnetics. So there are, uh, by default uh, couplings that are present like uh, electromechanical forces where we can couple uh, Lorentz, uh, Lorentz forces, which will be again um, based on the electric field, current density from the electromagnetics. And then it will be coupled to solid mechanics wherein it will be having some input um, from the Lorentz forces point of view in the solid mechanics, which will be causing some stress distribution. And that will be again, ultimately added to the stress tensor. 
So in COMSOL uh, with different kind of physics, uh, I think you can see on your screen. So these are all uh, having a predefined coupling. And definitely if you're looking for something new, you can extract any of the variable, make your own multiphysics coupling. So that's what we call our multiphysics coupling in, in COMSOL terms. All right. And uh, Mohan Kalyapan has a question uh, and he asks, uh, do you have fatigue and damage tolerance and crack growth case studies in the aerospace domain? Uh, I will need to check whether in the aerospace uh, do we have or not. But yeah, definitely we do have some case studies. Uh, maybe I can check afterwards and let you know. Uh, and maybe I can share some references or case studies uh, if we have on on in the aerospace uh, industry specifically and other stu uh, studies where we account for both damage and fatigue. All right, Mr. Prabhuljan, it was uh, wonderful having the session with you. And I would request you if you can just, you know, uh, put in your email ID uh, in the chat box so that, you know, the uh, audience can email the questions to you uh, and you can surely uh, give them an answer. Okay. Uh, I will type in two IDs. Uh, wherein we can connect, uh, you can connect it with. Uh, okay, so you can write to us at support at the rate .com. Uh, So wherein um, it will be the your query will be forwarded to the relevant uh, our, our expert in in the different fields. So then we can definitely be be getting in touch with you. So definitely feel free to ask uh, or share your queries on, on support at gridconsole.com. Uh, all right. Thank you so much for this, Mr. Uh, Prabaljan. And I really would like to thank Comsol as well to, you know, uh, providing us with this opportunity to, you know, to learn so much about the uh, uh, automotive component department. Mm -hmm. And uh, with this, I would like to end the webinar and I would really like to thank all the viewers who joined in today and have a great day, you guys. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank thanks, uh, Manu Bhava. Have a very good day. You do. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Have a